Hello and welcome to the AV Forum's Christmas podcast. And joining me on this edition are Steve Withers. Adored, come on, let's be honest, Lou, you paid for the women. Mark Hodgkinson. Get your standards and practices in here. I want to see wreaths. And Ed Selly. The bitch hit me with a toaster. Welcome to our Christmas podcast special, which is going to turn into a big Star Wars spoiler fest at the end. If you have not seen The Force Awakens and you do not want it spoiled... We are going to flag it up quite a bit before we get there. It's going to be the last thing on this podcast. So feel free to listen up until the point we tell you to switch off if you don't want it spoiled. We can't talk about the film without talking about plot, without talking about theory, and without talking about some major spoilers. Um, So like I say, if you don't want it spoiled, we're going to give you plenty of warning to switch off the podcast, and we're going to do all our Christmas messages and everything before we discuss The Force Awakens. So you're going to be well prepared to switch off in time. Um, if you've seen it and you want to join in with a, then just keep listening all the way through. Right, so before we get started, five-star ratings. Um, it is the last podcast of the year. We are not back again until, I think it's the 13th of January, Steve. Is that correct? Um, which will yeah, be that's our, correct, yeah. Which will be our CES special. So that'll be myself, Steve and Mark talking about CES, the big news and everything that we saw over there. So that is the next podcast. Uh, So we're off for Christmas. But before we go, five star ratings, people have sent them in. So we're each going to read one of these. And I'll start with Andy Clockwise, who said, been a listener since episode one of the podcast, not Star Wars. Kind of addictive and very enjoyable. Dan 201 said, I'm Ron Burgundy. Simon 156, uh, man after my own heart. Not only everything you wanted to know about AV, but a drinking game as well. Every time Rec 2020 is mentioned, you sip a beer. I started five years ago and now I'm an alcoholic. Simon, I share your pain, mate. Um, And and you've just given me a a, a window to my future. And thank you, Ed, for going over my typo of Bert rather than Butt. Meh. Steve Webb says, essential AV listening. Thank you, Steve. And uh, finally, Wootman UK says, the most informative AV website in the UK and Europe, a world apart from the high street glossy mags. Thanks for your five-star reviews, guys. Uh, Keep them coming in, please, people, because uh, every time there's a five-star review, it pumps the podcast up on iTunes. It adds it to uh, charts and the homepage and so on, and it gets more people involved. And that's what we're here for. We want to try and get as many people involved as possible and uh, talk everything that we know about when it comes to AV. So let's move on to current competitions. And seeing as Ed is full of Christmas cheer, uh, why don't you tell us what people can win? Right. Um, All members, uh, you have the opportunity to win a Yamaha RXA 3040 AV receiver, courtesy of SCAN. You've got until the 30th of December to do that. So when you're in a sort of mince pie-filled stupor after Christmas, just just go into that competition. Honestly, ignore all sort of, you know, minor concerns over specification. Cross that bridge when you come to it. Sonically, it's a masterpiece, that piece of kit. Just get stuck in. Winning it for free is fantastic. You also then have uh, until the 8th of Jan to uh, compete for a Lego Star Wars Stormtrooper alarm clock. Uh, You don't need to worry. uh, As a member of staff, Phil isn't eligible to enter or rig this competition, so it is actually available to win. Oh, I've already Uh, got one. Oh, well, there you go. Well, actually, I've got two and a Vader. Obviously, you need a great deal of help getting up in the morning. Um, That is available (laughs) to all members, uh, and you've got until the 8th of Jan for that, so you can sober up after New Year's Eve and think, do you know what? I could probably do with a better means of waking up. Yeah, but there is a stipulation that they said, and that is that they have to write a review of the force awakens do they now Uh, that's not listed in the copy so i didn't know that so you have to write a review whether it's great or it's okay counts as a review i don't know uh but i I dare say minimum 100 minimum 150 words i I, I like to see that people have done their research here living up to the av forms podcast do i get to enter the competition on the back of my review no No, you've got a double dip, Steve. Sorry, mate. <laughs> you'll, you'll have to use your your alter ego. Yeah, I could do an opposite review and say, I really hated it. <laughs> weave stithers. Um, and there are um, actually some winners this month to announce as well. Uh, Close Encounters Blu-ray was won by Twad. Twade? T. Ward. Did you get in touch. T. Ward, even. I don't know. Yes, it's, it's, I guess. Uh, and uh, Mission Impossible, Rouge Nation, uh, was won by Norlis. Uh, so congratulations to you both. I, I hope you enjoy your films. And uh, that uh, Norlis is busy looking at it going, Rogue, Rogue, not Rouge, not Rouge. And 
it doesn't matter how many times I see that word now. It is it's Rouge. Rouge Nation. <laughs> and we're looking forward to Rouge One next year as well. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. It's completely, completely spoiled. Right, okay, so uh, let's move on. And uh, as it is our Christmas special, uh, Steve's already on the drink. <laughs> it's, only, it's only one o'clock in the afternoon. I mean, Christmas side of the such a thing. We forgot the party poppers head, seemingly. Uh, I'm afraid so. Um, so let's have a look back at the year. Let's reminisce. Let's discuss what, what really caught our interest this year, what the innovations were, what their favourite products were. I'm going to go to Mark first for this one. What do you want? Innovations first? Because I think we're kind of a, uh, we're not there yet with the one I wanted to really see, which was uh, HDR. That's that's some more something to look forward to in the new year. Uh, we've got the first taste of it, a few clips uh, and the Amazon series, but it's just it's just not there yet. I don't think in in, in lots of ways. So um, that that was perhaps the most exciting innovation that, that I've seen, although it didn't quite deliver on some of the promises that in 2015. Um, in terms of products. Yeah, the mostly little boxes. You're going to be you're going to be surprised to hear. I think my, it was I got a first chance to see uh, LG's OLED, which was the EC nine seventy V, which nearly lived up to all my expectations. But it, but it it shows a massive promise of um, of what's ahead. That was really. Uh, so really the last year's model, wasn't it? So it was yeah, still carrying over some of the uh, limitations, shall we say, of that particular well, generation. Well, that's, that's right. It was yeah, it was like early on in the year. Quality. Yeah, so I mean, it, it was good. To, it was good to get a nice big OLED in the in the house and to see what it was all about. So that 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 was a good one. Um, I think my favourite product of the year, and the one I use probably the most, is the Nvidia Shield Android TV. Uh, it's got a combination of Netflix 4K at 24p, uh, great games, um, catalogue stream and through a streaming service with really high quality game streaming yeah, and all your Android apps to choose from so that's been really well used very slick very powerful um nvidia are on top of updates all the time so it's uh yeah that's a really cracking product and a similar vein uh the vbox tv gateway has, has found a, a real place in the home and it's a it's a, a router for your tv signal um but it's, it's also a pvr so I, I can access uh, any recordings I make on Freeview HD on any TV in the house now, and it's it, it just works. Um, even the, the, some of the family are actually using it as well. It's a really nifty little device. The Chromebox as a media player, so you, you stick open Alec on that, uh, and it is for most people. If you don't if you don't need um, 4K at 60 frames per second, it will take care of business on virtually everything, and it and it's slick and it's and it's powerful and it and it's a joy to use. To be quite honest, and then the last one would be something I've been using a lot this morning, and it's probably not one many people are going to go out and buy, but it's the uh, uh, the Meridio Fresco. Was it 6G? Is that right? I haven't written that down. Yep. Yeah, a uh, little pattern generator and uh, e did tester, and and it's just really really handy. It's you know it saved me an hour already this morning. So as uh, as the year sort of pads out next year, that's it's going to be a real time saving device, and and it's it's great. Okay, so uh, thanks for that, Mark. Um, let's go to Ed. I've got a funny feeling this is going to be a turntable or headphones. One of the other. Well, actually, you're wrong. The item in question is the Cord Mojo. Essentially, if you wanted to just get a handle on how good this product is, um, obviously I don't do measurements for my audio reviews for AV forums. It's not really within the remit of item uh, to, uh, equipment I've got at home. But I've been speaking to someone who does do a lot of product measurement. Uh, he's rather good at it. Uh, to put it in perspective, this £400 DAC puts in a better measured performance than what was previous benchmark was a £5,000 esoteric um, SACD player, uh, CD SACD player, and it's 400 quid and it fits in your pocket and you can use it with your phone. It is just outstandingly good. If you, it, I mean, there are, I, in the review, there is, I've got some quirks about the interface and so on and so forth, but sonically, it is just unbelievably good and it's 400 quid it really doesn't have anything in the way of competition. I mean, Cord has really moved the goalposts of what you can uh, expect from a digital product at fairly sensible money. So for me, in that regard, yeah, it moves the game on. It's sensible money and it's it's really, really very clever indeed. An honourable mention to the VPI Prime turntable, but that's a much more specialist undertaking. How is that an innovation? <laughs> 
the 3D printed tone arm is quite cool and pretty mm-hmm. clever. Um, and, uh, you know, at three and a half thousand pounds, I'm not going to pretend for a second that's not a lot of money, but you have to spend quite a lot more than three and a half thousand pounds to convincingly beat what it does, if that's your thing. Um, but I think the Cord is a more real world champion for me in 2015. Okay. Is that everything from you, Ed? Was was there anything? I tested lots and lots of things. I mean, uh, in terms of, for me, it's always a case of separating innovation, in which case, as they cord, um, get get it for for doing more at a fantastically low price point, and as say, VPI with some technical innovations. Um, Other than that, it's on a much more sort of emotional level. Uh, because it's it's slightly less sort of side, and let's face it, audio doesn't progress at quite the same breakneck speed. Uh, I mean, I, I thoroughly enjoyed both the Sony ZX2 Walkman and the Pioneer X100s. They are, you know, people have raised a very valid point. Is there a purpose, a, a point for these things in in a world of smartphones? And having now spent some time with both of them, yes, yes, they do justify their existence. But they're not products. They're not products of the year compared to compared to the state of the cord that is just head and shoulders above everything else i tested we we've played about with some some atmos equipment i still i don't know if steve feels differently to me on this i would still rather have a decent film with a soundtrack that didn't have atmos over transformers age of extinction just because it does um but yes it it the technology the, the applications of it are are good within the limitations of the films it's been saddled with so far. I just can't get that excited about it. There's been some uh, some decent films now that have been released. I mean, since the days of Transformers, I'm thinking of things like um, Mad Max Fury Road or Unbroken or um, I've yet to more recently Fury Road, actually, so. Mission Impossible Rouge Nation uh, is a particularly <laughs> fine example. It's a great movie and it's got a fantastic soundtrack. So there's certainly, um, I mean, it's still, you know, a growing format. But uh, whereas this year I've seen, uh, had a chance to listen to some DTSX. It's still not going to be officially released until next year, um, so it's well behind schedule. But um, you know, you've got you've got three formats that initially like, they might be competing with each other, but now it looks like it's gone the other direction. And TTS are clearly copying uh, Atmos's speaker configuration. I know they say they can do more and they can do this and they can do that, but the way it's going to be implemented implemented in every single AV receiver is going to be you set it up the same for both. And it sounds as though Auro are thinking we should do that too <laughs> so that we don't lose out. So it'd be interesting to see what they do do actually do next year and what happens in terms of studio support. But, um, but I think it's got potential. I certainly... Um, I certainly found it's enhanced my viewing experience on films that are good and made less good films more bearable. Fair enough. (laughs) Uh, Right, so that's Ed's highlights of the year. Um, I'm going to go next. For me, it has to be the Panasonic OLED, and not only the Panasonic OLED, but the fact that I got to go to Skywalker Ranch, which I think that's the highlight of the decade, never mind the highlight of the year, Uh, especially in the year that Star Wars is is out as well. And... uh, we mentioned the, the documentary that was with The Phantom Menace, Steve, a little while back. Um, we mentioned it in a couple of podcasts, and I found it on YouTube, the, f- the full thing, and watched it through again, because I got rid of my DVD a long time ago. I got rid of quite a few DVDs a long time ago. So I watched it again. It was, it was quite interesting thinking, I've been in that room. I've stood in that room. I've, I've been there. That made my decade, basically that. In terms of product, I think the Panasonic OLED, because... Even though the LGs are absolutely brilliant, when it comes to absolute picture quality, and this is what we're all about at AV Forums, is absolute picture quality. I think they nailed it, and I, I, I've always thought that Panasonic, since Pioneer left, Panasonic were definitely you know that way inclined, getting the best image, getting the image that's closest to how it's intended to be seen. And I was quite happy with their, their marketing angle, which took that on, that message on board. And, and if that a, bit, a company as big as Panasonic is taking that on and pushing that to the general public, it has to be you know, a really, really positive thing. And it helps our cause at EV Forums where we are pushing people to get better picture quality. It's not about preference. If you prefer something, then fine. We're, we're not saying don't watch something because you prefer it that way or whatever. But it could be so much better if you actually watch it the way it's intended. And who wouldn't want to watch something the way it's intended to be watched? I've, I've never understood why people would never want that. So having a company the sizes of Panasonic pushing that message and pushing it to the forefront of everything that they've done this year, including their marketing videos and so on, which showed the engineers making sure things matched and, and all the rest of it. And that came over in the product as, as well, didn't it, 
Mark, Steve, yeah, I mean, you both tested Panasonic products as well, and they all measured absolutely bang on this year. Yeah, the picture accuracy, even with the LEDs in, in sort of the lower saturation points at lower luminances, was really good, really impressive. And it, it does make a massive, massive uh, difference to the image. It just looks, it just looks better. Yeah, Mute. I think... Uh... Muted myself. Going on. Don't shut up. Uh, yeah, it was. Yeah, it just it put out really, really good set of uh, products over this year. I think at the top end. Anyway. Yeah, the whole three D loot thing just works. You know, and and the fact that they were able to put that across in an understandable way as well. You know, as, you know, as, as you reduce luminance, the the triangle that you're used to seeing it actually twists, and the way that they put that across. In the materials that they gave to us, um, and as well as what we've tried to include in the reviews as well, it just makes so much more sense to people. I think that because the loots exist, because the TV will map that way, it will remain accurate even at 75, 50, 25, 28 percent. It'll be bang on. You know, 32 percent. It'll be bang on because it's built into the system and it's there. And there's 8,000 records there, which is what you would expect from a 30,000 pound commercial display at 11 inches you know you're talking about a consumer tv having the same tech on board it's outstanding i think in general i've got to say credit to i don't know if you noticed this mark as well and you feel but overall i think the big brands the, the big four if you want to call them that uh, in terms of out of the box accuracy have really set up the game this year because yeah, a yeah, lot of bad. tvs have been measuring really accurate straight out of the box after a basic setup and bad news for crazy. calibrators, but good news for yeah, uh, yeah, consumers. Yeah, bad news for calibrators. Yeah. But for consumers, you can get a pretty accurate picture with some very, ba- you know, go and look at Picture Perfect page, follow those guidelines, and you will get a pretty accurate picture. And the majority of the TVs that I've reviewed this year, certainly from the big four, have, you know, really accurate grayscale, really accurate gammas, and very accurate color performance, yeah. including across the saturation streets. And that's impressive. Obviously, I think Panasonic will take it to another level in some, some aspects, but I think they've all upped their game this year. And that's good to see from, from a perspective of a consumer and also from our perspective. Well, obviously, what I mean, happens it's... if I'm 70 years old and I want my television to have bright orange faces so everyone... Well, well, well you, have, <laughs> you have the freedom to do that, Ed, because all we say to manufacturers when we speak to them, when they ask for our, you know, our input and stuff, you know, they'll come to us and they'll say, what is it that you're looking for? And we always say to them, you can have as many picture presets as you like and you can set it up how you like but as long as there's one preset in the tv that's either named cinema thx or something something similar to that true cinema or whatever as long as there's one preset that is bang on accurate out of the box for grayscale and color accuracy to rec 709 which is 99.999 percent of the material that we will be watching even for the next 12 to 18 months you know we'll still be 90 odd percent 99 percent of the material will still be mastered at rec 79 as long as the tv is capable of doing that in one preset they can have their you know fancy theater modes or whatever they want to have on David the TVs. Dickinson mode. It, yeah it's fine <laughs> you know if they, they want to have that and that they have to have something like that to sell in a shop normally shop mode or, or, or similar we don't mark them down on that as long as there's one preset that is accurate um, and and they take care to make sure that in that then there's no background processing going on there's nothing going on that's going to affect the image yeah that's that's the way we look at it so if yeah you know, like i said preference if, if you prefer it a certain way then fine nobody's going to argue with you i just think that if you know that material is made to a certain, a certain way and the tv's capable of showing you that why wouldn't you is my oh, no, no no you're not going to go the argument for me because because i'm not 70 and i don't like bright orange faces yet um, I'm looking like Dale Winton. Yeah. Yeah. But but yeah, you're right, Steve. I mean, they have made a, a big effort this year. It's good to see everybody. And when we're talking about the top four, Sony, LG, Samsung, Panasonic. So as long as they, like I say, we have, they have one preset and, and they've all done it this year, Steve. And like I say, I mean, the Panasonic pushing it on. That doesn't mean that there isn't other issues with their TVs. Um, you know, we're talking about LED TVs. I don't think any of the big four have actually nailed it in terms of backlight uniformity and so on. There's... there's everybody has had at some point something or other which it is a flaw basically i don't think it's a fault it's a it's a flaw with the technology and that leads on to you know the article that that was posted on monday this week that you wrote steve which is i think we need to temper some expectations out there of how, what a tv should be doing even at eight thousand pounds or ten thousand pounds it's not going to be perfect depending on the technology that's used because all the different technologies have their Achilles heels, their, their, their flaws, the, the way that they 
their compromises. I think is probably the best way of putting it. Yeah, and they and they always have. I mean, going all the way back to CRT, I and mean, we think we talked about it a couple of weeks ago. You know, the uh, ge- geometry on the on a CRT screen was um, was curved, wasn't it, in the other direction because of the shape of the um, screen at the front. Yeah, and, de- that was and just the nature of technology. And depending on where in your room you had it, and in terms of magnetic north, because the bigger the the, <laughs> the tube, the more influence the magnetic fields had on it. So yes, every technology has its limitations. All we can do is, is review them as best, you know, based upon industry standards and experience and various test material and uh, identify those limitations where possible and leave it out to the consumer to make up their own mind. And ideally, you know, I know it's not easy these days, but if you can go along and demo it yourself, have a look, see what you think and pick the TV that you like. I loved the uh, Panasonic OLED. It wasn't perfect. It had issues, of course. Uh, minor ones, I have to say. Um, largely limitations in OLED itself at the moment, particularly well, as everyone knows, there's a little bit of banding just above black. That was the main problem with Panasonic. But overall, it, it delivered an absolutely stupendous picture. I, 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 think, I think, before you go into your personal thing, I think for me, what did it with that and why I've picked it, even though it's £8,000 and if I had eight grand, I still wouldn't go and buy it. You know, I, I, want, I just wanted to highlight that. But for me, what it did was it, it, it showed us that even with OLED, the panel's not everything. It's, it was the, the engine and the engineering that they put in behind that to drive the panel a certain way, to make it look a certain way, to get the colours correct and using their loot technology and so on. I think that, that to me, was the innovation. You could admire them for moving the game on, even if you don't necessarily exactly. want to spend that money yourself. Exactly. I, I wouldn't spend that much money, but you're confident looking at 2016 and looking at how things are going to develop. Well, like, you can see that it can be developed and it can be worked on, it can be made to look a certain way without introducing new issues. So I think for me that was a big plus point. And why I've picked that as my innovation of the year. I, I think um, if it was my money and if I was buying a TV right now, although I wouldn't necessarily recommend that, given the amount of change we're going through at the moment. I, I loved the uh, the flat, and this is mostly because it's flat, the flat LG, um, the EF950. I thought that was that was a great TV, a uh, great OLED TV. Uh, you know, performance-wise, it was almost as good as the Panasonic. And obviously, it was three grand, che- more than that, four grand cheaper, half the price nearly. And you can pick it up with some pretty good deals right now if you look if you shop around. So that was a great television, in my opinion, and I really, really liked it. In terms of innovation, it is, uh, I think when it was announced, it came out of nowhere. But uh, Epson bringing out a laser projector to at a cons- you know a consumer price not like the one that Sony announced at 60 grand but you know this is 5000 quid and it's a laser projector and I thought that was a fantastic product um again things are changing fast and so it might be considered slightly um in terms of future proofing there's a few things it might not do uh, like no HDR obviously from that projector but then again I, I happened to just by coincidence calibrate one yes- uh, yesterday and um its, de- its color space was over 100% of DCI, so um, it could hit DCI no problem at all. It's 10-bit, um, so it definitely can take advantage. It's 8-god HDCP 2.2. So from the point of view of Ultra HD Blu-ray, it will be able to take advantage of that. The only thing it couldn't do would be um, HDR. But I think, personally, though you agree, Phil, or not, but laser is the future for projection because no bulb, no dimming, no problems, consistency, longer life, uh, brighter, wider color space. Um, you know, laser is definitely the way forward. And I think Epson really came out of nowhere when they announced that. I didn't know they were working on it. It was a very unusual, for them it was an unusual product because it was using technology that's similar, very similar to JVC's um, DILA and it included things like their version of eShift. So it was almost like a JVC projector but with laser laser projection technology and um, Epson's badge on it. It was um, even the layout of the projector was similar. It was a different chassis but it was, you know, air vents on either side, centrally mounted um, lens. It all looked kind of similar. Um, but that came out of nowhere, and so that was a big innovation for me. I think laser projection is the future. Well, that. we've just had an announcement today that Optoma yes. will be showing uh, laser projection at ISE. Uh, end of Jan- no, it's beginning of February, ISE, mm-hmm. in Amsterdam. It's, beginning of February. it's a show that, sadly, we don't cover and we haven't covered on the site because it, it in the past it has been very industry-orientated. It's very much a custom install show, uh, much the same way as the CDA show is in the US, uh, very focused on custom installation but again it's another another one of these shows where we do get projector announcements so interesting to see that and the first single chip dlp 4k projector from yeah, them that's so a, that's it's surprising. not it's not the same thing I, it, when i saw it come through i thought oh laser 4k dlp it's not yeah, confused it's me not, from, yeah I, it, I thought that too i think it's live they're really coming that's no awesome. no no it's two di- two different products <laughs> and the laser projector isn't it isn't really a home cinema thing is it no it's not it's it's like i say it's a big custom install show so expect that one to have quite a 
quite a price tag on it, I would but imagine. It's interesting that TI have finally developed a, a, a 4K single chip DLP um, yeah. option at a realistic price, presumably, as opposed to the silly money that it has been costing in the past. Yeah, it's just how many of those tiny mirrors have they managed to fit on there? <laughs> <laughs> Little teeny tiny mirrors. <laughs> Right, okay, so I think that wraps up our our look back at the best innovations and and our favourite products of the year. And it's nice to see that we've all picked something different. I mean, Ned was always going to pick something different, but (laughs) nice to see that the three of us who predominantly review displays and and tend to spend most of our time looking at that kind of thing, we've all picked something different there, so that's interesting. I would have added an audio product if you'd let me finish. Uh, Right, so let's move things on. Um, You know, the biggest event that happens in the very near future something that that we're all really excited about and that's ces uh 2016 it begins on the 5th of january mark's going to be sitting with uh matchsticks holding his eyes open um into the wee small hours in the uk because he's going to be following all the streams of all the big press conferences even though me and steve will be in vegas and we'll be about a 10 minute drive away from the venue where the press conferences are held just going on previous experience this is my 10th year there uh this will be year number four for you steve or number no, five? five number five really you old veteran no eh? six six is my sixth <laughs> ces this yeah. is my fifth year of sitting at home yeah my sixth right. year, yes. the reason for that going by experience and the number of years that we've been doing it is that we could sit in the press conference and mark would still get all the details and get it all up and in a readable and interesting way before me and Steve could ever do that because the way the press conferences run is it's 45 minutes with 15 minutes to get to the next one so and there's you, already a massive queue so you and there's always already the massive queues and, and you're queuing to get in I mean you well, let's face it they're often not very interesting are they well I mean you're lucky to get into the Samsung one I think it was one year we stood there never been in, I've never been in the Samsung one <laughs> we couldn't get in you know, I mean, you know, if you're going to do anything, you'd, you'd have to split up and you'd have to go and stand for, for queue for 45 minutes to get off an hour to get into places. Um, so that's why we do it via the streams. But what it does do is it gives us plenty of opportunity, Steve, to go and do other things. And even though the show doesn't open to the Wednesday, it runs to the Sunday. Um, we get there on the Sunday evening. So Monday, you would think, would be a write-off. But actually, there's, there's quite a bit going on before the show this year, which is quite strange. And I think it's because it's so close to the new year. Um, so we're expecting hopefully, to get to see Samsung on the Monday evening for a preview. Now, space is a bit tight, so we might not be able to do that. We might not be able to video. So if that's the case, then we're going to go to Unveiled. Um, or we might actually go and see uh, the Ultra HD Alliance the as Alliance well. There's quite a, quite a number of things. They all tend to be run at the same time on the Monday. So we're going to see how the lay of the land works and get the best one for us for coverage and so on. Like I say, Mark's going to kick things off on the Wednesday. On the Tuesday, we're with LG. Uh, nice stand tour and we're also um early tour with panasonic the thing there is that we probably can't put anything out to the wednesday um but we're going to get in and get a first look so we're expecting some big announcements from samsung lg and panasonic so that'll be interesting so what we're we expecting i'm gonna go out on a limb here and i think sony are gonna launch an oled tv and i think it'll be an lg display panel that's my a limb huh? i think we all think that don't we yeah yeah, it'd be great. It'd I mean, definitely it'd be, great be an LG more. panel. Who else makes them? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be nice to see someone else announcing the making panels, wouldn't it? It's not going to happen, but it'd be nice to see. I'd like to see more manufacturers in general just releasing over to you know the Chinese, the cheaper brands. I'd like to see them get involved this year. They said they were going last year, but they didn't. It didn't happen, did it? Uh, t- well, two years ago, um, the likes of Hisense and TCL did have OLED yeah, right. on their stand. They didn't have it last year. I think last year they were really pushing the ULED and and so on. Um, I think a lot of people, are, the, the, a lot of the companies are, and manufacturers are still trying to make money out of the LCD. But why not? Because it doesn't cost them a hell of a lot to produce this stuff. They have had higher margins on it, so they're going to push that. But I think the time's come now with with LG investing so much money and they've just invested another ten million in a UK advertising campaign, which has been running for a few months now. I mean, the adverts are everywhere at the moment yeah. for all they're doing a massive um ridley scott directed promo uh in the super bowl yeah for the super bowl yeah. so they're spending yeah. another 10 million on that and on a related note it looks very likely we'll see a 55 inch rollable oled from um from lg which will grab some headlines i thought you said rollable rollable <laughs> yeah <laughs> it only spikes, spikes. That would change that film. yeah which i think will break it in the mainstream press and really raise awareness because that you know everyone will cover that at the bbc i'll have it you know they'll be on the from it'll be on newspapers it's, it's that kind of headlining product that you know could and people and, will then know the difference there is a difference you know and do you know do you know something mark about ooh, it would have been 2000 and 
nine. I saw that on the Sony stand. Rollable really? OLED yeah. TV. It was only ten inches, but you could roll it up. Yeah, there's something. Well, they've got we've got products to back it up now, haven't we? There, there are TVs out there you can you can buy. So if they can grab some headlines in that way, and, and people will then know there is a difference between OLED and LED. Well, this was the whole reason why OLED were the first TVs to have the curve because it was a way of showing how flexible the OLED technology was, and that you could do things like that. Yeah, they really opened um, Pandora's box there, didn't they? <laughs> yeah, but by doing that, yeah, then you know we suddenly had LED TVs, and you're thinking, well, why the hell have we got curved LED TVs? That, that, you know, the whole point was to show how flexible OLED was. It was a demonstration point more more than anything else. Well, um, I was being cynical. I would say it was Samsung trying to pee on. Um, I was spoiler. I was pure, <laughs> it was pure spoiler in my opinion. Yeah, of course, it, of course it was. And and everybody else did it because Samsung did it. And uh, Samsung are shifting the biggest amount of TVs. So anything that Samsung does, generally everybody else does follow on. Although it was, it was quite interesting to see that uh, that we our opinion was asked, wasn't it, Steve? I think it, most most people in the press were asked. Uh, by a couple of companies who were making TVs, should we make a curved TV? We're not sure. What do you think? Um, so you know there was there was a lot of that going on, and I think I think that's that's done it. You know I think that's now so 2014, isn't it? Well, I think they want to make curved TVs. That's fine. I, mean, I have no issue with that. I mean, the, the important thing is that you provide people with the choice. You know, you make the TV in a curved or a flat version. Let the market decide. Which is why it was so great when. LG finally released the um, EF950 because you finally got what everyone basically wanted, a flat OLED television. So, as always, choice is good. Give people the choice. Give them both versions. Let the market choose. And, of course, there's, there's some uh, disc format that's supposed to be getting announced as well, isn't there? That's all that matters to me. I don't care about anything else, really. I mean, it'd be nice to see the UHD Alliance and, and the manufacturers get their act together and agree on some standards for, you know, both... I mean, already there are already standards for Blu-ray, but, you know, degree on standards for broadcast TV, degree on standards for, for 4K televisions. To agree on a single HDR standard would be fantastic. But, really, all that matters to me is that we get a proper launch of um, Ultra HD Blu-ray with some decent titles announced and full studio support. If we don't get that, I'm jumping out of the plane on the way back, Phil. If it doesn't happen this CES, then they really are up against it. Uh, they're not, they aren't in the shops by March. We've got a real problem. They have to be in the shops. They have to <laughs> announce it. And they have to have players in the shops in March, by March, or by, you know, by the spring, when the TVs start hitting, you know, the new TVs start coming out and what? I guess April, May. If they're not players in the stores by then with discs and decent movies backing it up and not Smurfs 2, uh, it's buggered. It can just, well, I'm screwed from that point on. Then, <laughs> I was sat there watching um, Bloodline on, in 4K last night on a 65 inch TV and I was I, I was just thinking to myself, how much better is it going to get? Because it was, it looked fantastic. I was really yeah, struggling yeah. to find any problems with that picture. I, I've, it, got, I've got to say the same, Mark. I mean, I've been watching uh, that 4K Sony projector and the, the JVC X7000 through the uh, the Sony player with Netflix 4K and watching stuff like Marco Polo and yeah. some other stuff in 4K and you're looking at it and you're thinking I mean it it it's better than Blu-ray quality that you're looking at there on yeah. on that size of screen and you th and you're thinking well you know what what is UHD Blu-ray going to offer me over this is going to offer me better sound better Pro sound pro probably a slightly better, better picture probably overall. a slightly better picture and consistency. Well, you know, if you've got a decent inter inter no, internet connection, no, no, but it could still go seen... down, couldn't it? What happens well, if it, it goes could, down? yeah, it could go down. But then, you know, what happens if you blow a fuse in your in your player? What happens if the people providing that f f film decide to drop it from their catalogue, or they don't? It's not on the, you know. Yeah, but, I just but don't like yeah, but yeah, but then again, Steve, you're not going to get everything you want on 4K Blu-ray, are you? You know, no. it's up to what they're going to release. So, you know, that argument doesn't really I'm not really buying start. everything on 4K Blu-ray. I'm just saying, you know, we all have our favourites and you, I kind of want them on something where I know I can watch it when I watch it, whenever I want to watch it. And it will be exactly the same every time. Yeah. And I'm not beholding on anybody else to provide that to me because I don't, I don't want to be. I know it's an old-fashioned approach, but I don't want to be dependent on somebody else to deliver something to me. But anyway, we're going to have to move this conversation on, but... Uh, they have to announce it, so it has to be at CES. So, if you see a lack of uh, of UHD um, Blu-ray content and Steve suddenly disappears from hosting the videos, I've killed myself. He, he'll have jumped off. He'll have jumped off the stratosphere. Off the Hoover Dam. <laughs> Hoover Dam with the strat. Why would you go all the way to Hoover Dam? The stratosphere is just down the road for you. No, no, I'll do it off that massive bridge above the Hoover Dam that you wouldn't walk out onto because it was too high. Make sure you <laughs> film it, Steve. I feel sorry. <laughs> 
Oh yeah, you I'll could, film. You I'll could get film. a GoPro with one of this. Yeah, <laughs> <I'll>, come on. <laughs> Let's see how, how robust they truly are. <laughs> Once again, it's that time of the year and CES is fast approaching, but before then, we've got the little inconveniences called Christmas and New Year to contend with, and we have been blown away at the number of downloads the podcast gets every week with a regular 3,000 downloads. We're also thrilled when you, the listener, leave us feedback either in the forum threads or on iTunes with thoughts about what we've discussed, and it tells us that the community at large enjoy what they hear, so thank you very much. The podcast's not only an extension of the editorial content on AV forums, but of the community as well. And while we like to have a good laugh, we also try hard to bring you the most relevant news and knowledge from the world of AV. Sadly, we had to say goodbye to the games podcast this year and the editorial, as the team went their separate ways, and we thank them very much for all the hard work that they put into the site. I know I can also speak on behalf of AV Forums founders Stuart and Vicky in thanking the moderators for keeping the forums and the community we all love running smoothly every day of the year. And finally, to you the listener, forum member, editorial reader and viewer. Have a very Merry Christmas and a safe and prosperous New Year. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. are going to split the podcast at this point if you do not want star wars the force awakens spoiled in any way you don't want to talk about the you don't want to hear about the plot or anything else then we wish you a merry christmas we hope you'll join us for the ces podcast on the 13th of january so please switch off and uh, exit the podcast now because we are going to talk about star wars the force awakens we've all seen it i have seen it two times steve how many times have you seen it twice so far Ed? Once. Mark? One time. Uh, still, that's still uh, one, two, three, four, five times more than normally when it's just me that's seen it. <laughs> this is true. That is true, Stephen. That is a 200% gain on last year for me <laughs> in terms of going to the cinema. Um, I went and seen it at the 11 o'clock showing on IMAX 3D at the Metro Centre uh, in Newcastle Gateshead. Their IMAX screen, it's not a, a massive IMAX screen, but it's not a IMAX, it's sort of in between. I am almost convinced they have changed the projector in there because it is far brighter than I ever remember it being, and the black levels were superb. Uh, 3D was stunning, and the audio was unbelievably good. I mean, good luck making your home cinema sound as good as that, just for the sheer space sound pressure level in that in that giant room with a giant screen. There's no way you can replicate that. Well, there is. It'll cost you five million quid and you'd have to have a house with a room big enough to, to do it, like stadium-sized room, but unbelievably good. It left me with mixed feelings. I think everybody coming out of the film that I've spoken to had mixed feelings about it on the first viewing. Well, you came out in tears. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> Thanks, Steve, for telling the whole world that. I mean, it's, it's, quite, it's quite, quite different. We're always going to share that, won't we? It's quite difficult walking through the metro centre when you've got bloodshot eyes, because no, you just look like a large <laughs> number of the other residents of Gateheads. Just they have bloodshot eyes for completely <laughs> different reasons. Do you want to just clarify why you were in tears? It wasn't because you were so upset. What do you mean? Well, you could have been coming out in tears because you were emotionally moved, or you could have come oh, out well, crying because it was bloody awful. Well, I was moved, I, I, for some strange reason. Right, I was fine for the first sort of fifteen twenty minutes of the film, until the old cast came on screen, and especially when Leia turned up after the battle at Mazi's temple. When they came on screen and and Han and Leia's theme started, for some reason I just got really quite emotional. I don't know why. I think it was just because they were on screen and then Chewie went over and gave her a hug and, you know, it was like the old team getting back together again type thing. I mean, it had been 30 odd years. 32? Since we'd last seen them on screen together like that. And, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know what it was. It, it, I just got quite emotional. On it. And then there was the other bit that we'll come on to, which you could see coming, but even even still, it, it was one of those moments. And then again, I, it, at the end, it was just, I don't know, it just... And I, I sat there through the credits, just saying to myself, "Compose yourself, compose yourself. <laughs> keep keep the glasses on for the, for, for the minute. 
compose yourself. I did find it genuinely emotional, but I came out with mixed feelings. Definitely came out with mixed feelings. So I went and seen it again the same day at quarter past ten on the evening. I managed to get a ticket for two, and actually there was about ten of us in the screen, which I was quite surprised about. But seemingly all the IMAX screens were sold out completely. The other screens were they were either selling out or by ten o'clock in the evening because it was playing on so many screens. There was about ten, fifteen people in in that screen. The projector was rubbish. The black levels were, were terrible because there was things that I saw in the three D version, especially the opening which is really quite dark and there's a lot of shadow detailing and stuff on oh, when the, that shit flies in front yeah of the there's loads of shadow yeah. detail and stuff on the 3d version um it was just a black mess on on the other projector was and, it a and more authentically 1977 <laughs> experience <laughs> almost uh, almost i mean it was in 235 um ratio it was a big screen i mean it, it was still a, a 200 seat auditorium with stadium seating and so on um so it was still a, a, a big big screen room but um but no it was the presentation wasn't quite good the sound was all right but it still wasn't as good as the the imax 3d but yeah i felt i needed to see it a second time and i felt better after seeing it a second time i don't know about you steve yes i i think i i actually enjoyed it more the second time because the first time i saw it obviously i was sitting there thinking please don't be crap please don't be crap uh, and obviously when I went to see it the second time I knew what to expect and therefore could just sit back relax enjoy the film for what it was it's not perfect it's got some flaws I, I mean I think when I wrote the review which was quite late in well, like f- at 4 a.m I was still you know on a high and thinking oh it's great I think probably with hindsight now that I've digested it more seen it again and thought about it more I, I think it's probably an 8 out of 10 rather than 9 out of 10 it's, it's very good it delivers in, in many respects it you know let's be honest there's a lot riding on this film from the point of view of Disney, they spent four billion buying Lucasfilm. They needed to be a success. They've got another two films already in production. Um, they've got one coming out next Christmas, and they've got episode eight coming out next May. So, you know, if it had tanked for some reason or it had been awful, they would have been in real trouble. So they had a lot riding on it. We obviously had a lot riding on emotionally. We wanted to be better than the prequels. And I think it, del- it delivers really what I can best describe as a Star Wars greatest hits package. Uh, it's got it hits all the right notes. It, it there's obviously a checklist of what you want to see, and it does all that. Plot-wise, it's a little it, well, not more. It's it's very unoriginal. It basically follows a Star Wars plot. Yeah, but it, but it's a but it's a but Star it's Wars fun. it's a Star Wars it, film and it's fun. Yeah, it's fun and it looks like a Star Wars film and it, I was staggered at how much of it's practical, practical effects, sets, real locations, real prosthetics and makeup, fantastic. So in that sense, it genuinely felt like a Star Wars film. But, but did did back. but did you? get emotionally involved were you the same the first time i saw it no that's probably because i was a bit tired second time i actually did start to get well up a bit um like you say at the same point as you did when when leia and hannah together um because i guess because it's i realized how much of a part of my childhood those characters were you know a huge part of my childhood when i was 10 and saw star wars it was the best thing i mean in my limited experience of life at that point it was the high point it was everything i'd ever Mm. wanted a film to be ever everything was there lightsabers i mean god like laser swords you read about them in books but there it was on screen spaceships flying around villains heroes it was everything absolutely everything i wanted to see and it in it it did affect me for the rest of my life for good or for bad Uh, and the prequels were a painful experience not just because i was an adult and therefore perhaps looking at from a different perspective but they just weren't very good this was great it was fun it was well made it was it was no it was, it was genuinely funny. There are some really genuinely funny laugh yeah, out loud moments yeah. in it. The cast are great. The new people are superb. The chemistry, uh, the chemistry. Dave and John Boyega were absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Who's the one um, that looks like um, Raul Julia from the Adams family? Dameron or whatever his chops is. Poe Dameron, yeah, he's yeah, really yeah. good. And he's yeah, all right. He was he good. Just looks like Raul Julia. And he's not wedge, so he can. He's the, just good enough. There wasn't there wasn't any character in there that I didn't like. I couldn't stand um, Kylo Ren. Right. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll come on to that in, in in a little bit. So hang on to that. In terms Mark. of originality, I do like the idea of looking at things from the perspective of a stormtrooper who just wants to get the hell out of this. I thought that was great. And, and his character, the idea, basically, is just run away. Let's get the hell out of here. Being essentially a bit of a coward initially, and then stepping up to the plate later in the film was was great. I mean, because it was yeah. a genuinely original note. It's <laughs> otherwise a very unoriginal film. It was. It played it spectacularly safe. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I think I that. think he would be damned if he did, and you damned if he don't. Oh yeah, yeah, totally. But uh, be honest, the plot wise, there's some massive bloody holes in that. Film. There, there is. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> I, I didn't awesome. mind holes. I, I, I like I, it. Moved the storyline along quite fast, and it was you know it was great to watch. That's what JJ Abrams always does. You, that's you watch fine. These films they go That's real fast, fine. and then you stop and think and think. Hang on a minute. Yeah, but I, 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 any sense at all? Yeah, directly but, lifting 
story and 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 the, you know stuff out of the the other movies did he really need to take it that far? well you see i th- i think it some of it is is there to move things along but i also think some of it's pretty clever plot exposition to be honest and i think a lot of the plot holes will get filled in in the fullness of time Maybe, but I kind of didn't like leaving a film with more questions than I, you know. I, I, I did, I did, so because I did because explain. think think of a new hope, Steve. Right? You didn't know what the force was. You didn't know what the clone wars. Well, no, they explain what the force the, is in the film. You though. didn't, you true. didn't, you didn't know what the clone wars were. You know, you got told about it, but you didn't know what it was. They didn't give a a whole explanation of what it was. You only got one side of the story, which was Obi Wan's side of the story. So it wasn't until Empire that you got the second side of the story, was it? Really? Yeah, I don't know, but that's right. So you got you got one bit. perspective on that, right? There was lots of things in the trash compactor. Where the hell did Luke go? It was only Uncle Deep. I mean, there's huge but errors and potholes and all the rest. Of it. It's Hokum. It's Star Wars. It's supposed to be like that. You know what I mean? It's, you're not supposed to. Oh no, but come on. You know, the one the Star one thing Wars, I, I wouldn't want is is the film to keep stopping because they have to. You know, tell us yeah. plot points and what's going on, and all the rest of it. No, yeah, well, yeah, I'm sorry, it's but there are. Come on, it's like the in the in the original three. It's the alliance to restore the republic. Yeah. Now, the film intimated pretty strongly, to the extent of blowing up their whichever planet it transpires to be, that the republic had been a functioning entity since then, and yet this rebel group still existed. There's a word for that: <laughs> terrorists. No, no, they they existed to fight the new or the. First yeah, order. but they don't explain it very well. Because I mean, it's like, that's, so where's the Republic? That, that's, that's an Yeah, but, yeah but sorry, I'm going to disagree with you because I don't think you should have to... Because there was lots of things in Star Wars that the original trilogy that you didn't know about. There was a lot of characters whose names are never mentioned in the films. You see them on screen, but, they're never, but if, you know, as, as a 12-year-old, I knew all the characters because I, I went away and f- found out who they were. You know what I mean? There was loads of those bounty hunters there that you never knew what the names were, but... You went out and found out who they were, bought, and then the figures, the, Wars figure. the figures came out, and you started to know well, who, actually, who was who. They never who mentioned Boba Fett by name in The Empire Strikes Back. That's just something you kind of knew. But, but what I mean is that I sat there thinking, okay, so after the Jedi, because it's a 30 year gap, right? And there's, so there's a new Republic, there's the Neo, what, what, what do you want to call them? The First Order, that's basically a Neo Empire. Where do they come from? Who's supporting them? What's funding them? So the Re- Republic are, are supporting rebels against the new Empire, but where's that? place geographically i don't understand there was a lot of i mean maybe they'll explain more but it, it just felt like i, I think i think all the scene very well all of that will get explained sort of all of that will get explained and better be like like everything else like the marvel universe i think you're going to see that standalone films are going to fill in a lot of the holes as well and you will get merchandise you're going to get books you're going to get things that are going to fill in the yeah, time you between you have to read a book to fill in the gaps in a film for but you did film, but you maybe. did with the the you didn't they, didn't the they, they worked. They the worked. Empire, they were in charge. They you were the had bad the guys, option of together. filling in additional detail, but it wasn't necessary. But what you needed was in the film, and I didn't feel that what I needed was actually there. Sometimes I think they were being a bit loose with, and I understand why. You don't want to stop the film and then give masses of exposition because that was really boring. But because let's look at the prequels, they're full of it, right? Full of exposition and not enough. Yeah, well, I was just going to bring you back to it. Could have been the prequels, so let's yeah, just no, let's I, just, just think thank that. No, I, I think a lot of the stuff, I, I think a lot of the plot holes have to be left open because they will get filled in. Like, who is Ray? Well, there's lots of theories going about about who Ray is. And I think there's a lot of clues in the film because I didn't pick up on them the first time around. Second time around, I did start to pick up more clues as to who she might be. One of the obvious things was that when you see her force stream, when she touches the lightsaber, you hear Ben Kenobi's voice in there who says you've taken your first small steps right before the dream ends. You hear his voice. I didn't hear it first time around. Heard it second time around. You also see her being handed to somebody on Jakku, and she is wearing a younglings outfit. So that, to me, points that she was one of Luke's younglings when he started up his Jedi Academy. Is it his daughter? It could very well be. But I think what would be even more interesting is if she isn't his daughter. But I certainly think she was part of Luke's, and and she had already been trained to a certain level. As a Jedi, yeah, and they, were, they were hiding her away from and Kylo hiding Ren. her away, so so she wouldn't get found by Kylo Ren. The other thing is that Max Vincedo, who's what? What was his character all about? Yeah, we don't know. We don't know his name or anything in it. It's... Lor Lor Santeca was his name. No, it's not well, mentioned in the film, though. Is it? Although That's it's not like it's like, like I said before, it's not mentioned in the film. You have to go away yeah, and find this he? stuff out. Um, the the speculation is, and I I think it's it's I think he's the Ben Kenobi role. I he's keeping an eye on her. 
She doesn't know who he is, but he's there. He's to not keep... doing a very good job of that now, on account of the fact that he's dead. Yeah, but he's obviously there to protect, and he was the one that had the map to look. So, so he he was placed there to 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 fulfil a role, and the role was probably to get her back to look when the time was right. So, I certainly think that's that that would fill in quite a few of the plot holes if that is the case. And like I say, having seen it a second time, picked up on those points, and I've also done a bit of reading around and seen what other people are saying and also looking at fan theories and that kind of thing it all makes sense and it, it kind of ties things up quite nicely in terms of plot holing there the other one is how come and this is just the way it happens in star wars films i know it takes some people out of the movie but wasn't it just convenient that the millennium falcon was sitting in the in the scrapyard yeah, right the hunk, <laughs> hunk of junk right and wasn't it convenient that within five minutes of them uh, getting into space han and chewie found them um yeah, it's all conveniences and all this. But if you think back to the original films, you know what I mean? There was conveniences. There was things that turned up that, that, that didn't really make a lot of sense. But if you take the whole view that the Force is controlling in some way destinies and that kind of thing, then it kind of makes a little bit of sense. But I'm, I'll let that stuff go, really. I'm, I'm not too bothered about yeah, that. There's plenty of coincidences in the other Star Wars films as well. E- exactly. Yeah, so, stuff like exactly. that was less concerning. I mean, for me, going back to the use of physical effects and things like that, it... Please don't misinterpret me here. I think it is a good film. I think it is a competent kickoff. But it did demonstrate beyond doubt to me that simply going back to physical props, it's not, it doesn't work quite the same way. Ultimately, when you're doing physical props and you've got a budget of all the money in the universe, it's not the same thing. It Ultimately, it it sort of cemented for me that the charm of the original trilogy is that they are well-polished B-movies um, with all that that entails and that making them, do, doing it on a rather more professional and with a lot more riding on it, it, it don't get me wrong, it didn't fall down the same pitfalls as the, as, the, as the prequels, but it just isn't quite the same thing. Yeah. I would also obviously accept that there is, you know, me being... 35 years old and you know grouchy and cynical is going to have an effect on that as well but nonetheless yes okay they're using more physical stuff but it's it's purpose crafted it doesn't look like it's been you know hammed together that morning from stuff that was lying around in someone's wash bag and yeah it to me that that had a had an effect on things and whilst i agree with you i do think the new cast did a pretty solid job i I don't know. I don't get that excited about. I mean, I was. I have to say, weirdly, I quite liked Kylo, and I like the fact that he looks like Andy Samberg, um, mm-hmm. which sort of cheered me for reasons I can't fully explain. Cheered me up quite a lot. Um, otherwise, yeah. Uh, to be honest, uh, it, Star Wars has never been about great acting, so um, in many ways that that sits in quite nicely. Choosing my words carefully, I did like whilst most of the phys- the humans and and aliens and so on and so forth within the prequels were non-entities I couldn't have given a stuff about. I loved how they had very carefully, people who had done the mechanical side of the design, had shown the origin points of all the things that we loved in the original trilogy. I was hoping for a bit more ambition in the new, in, in hardware that appeared in this film. And there really isn't. And they've played it painfully safe in that regard with the exception of the aesthetics of the 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 first order planet come base thing it it was 1983 all over again now we see that yeah i'm glad you said you talked about sky killer base what a terrible name i know why he's named it because obviously it used to be star killer base isn't it yeah yeah it used to be luke it was luke sky um star killer and he changed it at the last minute so you know that's a reference back to that 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 was the one lazy thing for me the one yeah, another point death for me, star another death seriously. star. I was singing to me in my head that we don't need another death star to the tune of uh, the Mad Max three. <laughs> yeah, at the end, <laughs> just yeah. in my head. Yeah, yeah. That I mean, for, for me, because you know, yeah, great. You're going to build as a planet, but how does the pa- planet move? Uh, I just, how how does it go from system to system? Mm. Even if we accept, I mean, I just wanted this to be, you know, X Wing Mark two slightly different Tie Fighters, so on and so forth. Just thirty years and no progress mm. at all. Oh, I'm sorry, that was... That, I don't know, that, actually, if you look at our world, though, things don't change that much in 30 years. You look at military aircraft... Still... Yeah, you look in a state of constant conflict and things change really quickly. Well, long and the short of it is I wanted a cooler X-Wing. I didn't get it. 
I don't want to go into a, <laughs> a non-canon argument on this. Um, uh, I mean, you know, also, I mean, as I say, it's interesting. You guys have already gone to see it again. I've seen it once. Uh, I'll probably undoubtedly pick it up in some form of Blu-ray disc as and when it is released. I don't. I'm gonna go and burn, I'm burn gonna go, go back and see it no, again. I'm off to see it again in IMAX next week. IMAX 3D again. Because it, it was such a such a great screen, and I'm going to go and see it again. Well, I, think I, I think I need to see it again. A confirmation for me that I need to get a new glasses prescription because 3D. I've got some serious problems with 3D, and I know that the, the screening was fine. I've got some proper issues now, so um, yeah, I've got to get that sorted first. Uh, right. So a couple of other things to quickly go through. I mean, obviously there there is that scene. <laughs> um, and that's it. I think we've seen it coming at uh, quite a mile off. Because the big spoiler is that obviously that Kylo is Ben, who is um, the son of Leia and Han. I had a few issues with this because emotionally I didn't feel Han and Leia, unless you know they they are protecting themselves, felt that that emotionally connected to their son. I think Han did, but Leia didn't seem as fast to me. I don't know if anybody else picked up on that. I, I, I don't know. That it, the, the idea of uh, Kylo Ren changed quite late in the day because the screenplay that Michael Arndt wrote originally before J.J. Abrams and Lance Kasdan rewrote it, it was a, a Jedi killer, more of a not specifically a relative or someone connected directly with the with the um, the other characters and, and it was their rewrite that turned him into Han and Leia's son, which I guess gives it more of an immediacy than some other new character who's just hunting down and killing Jedi um, on behalf of, presumably on behalf of the uh, of the um, first order, I also thought it's kind of strange there were no Jedi, no Force ghosts knocking around since there was such a big deal at the end of Jedi. Well, uh, uh, force, again, they, in a Force stream, there are voices there. The yeah. Ben Kenobi's voice for a start, and possibly even the the shot with R two and the guy in the cape with the hand, and you kind of assume that's uh, Luke, but of course, Anakin also lost an arm, so it could have been a flashback of some sort because there were originally plans to have a Anakin Vader Force ghost appearing as well, at one point. Well, so, well there is rumours that Christian Hadeson is in training for the next film. For the next film, yeah. yeah. So he's going to make an appearance. But this kind of leads on to Kylo and and him wanting to follow in the footsteps of his granddad, who's obviously Darth Vader. I think that's where the mask comes from. I think it's pretty obvious. Yeah, he's like a Vader the, fanboy, isn't he, really? Yeah, and, and he wants to... And obviously... Now, was it him that turned on Luke and Luke's Jedi Academy? That's because, what they imply, isn't it? Yeah, that was it's, it's implied, but they'd never actually say that it was him. Which brings us on to Snook. Um, Grand right, Leader chaps, Snook. I'm really sorry. Uh, I have to call it a day at this point because uh, I have got trains that I cannot miss. Uh, I would like to wish everyone uh, a very Merry Christmas uh, and uh, I will be back and not try to disappear off to another country on the 13th of January. So have a lovely time one and all. Uh, it's been emotional. Force be with you and all that. And uh, I will speak to you a little bit later on. Cheers, Ed. Merry Cheers, guys. Merry Christmas. Cheers. But yeah, c- coming back to Kylo, I-, I think you know it might have been a rewrite, Steve. Um, but I think it's, it's quite it fits quite well that the fact that he wants to be another Vader. There's a lot of that made in it. You know, I- she reads his mind. Ray reads his mind and said, "You you'll never be as powerful as Darth Vader." Yeah. Um, that that is his one goal. That's his one desire. And I think he thinks that the more evil he does, the more evil he'll be. The more with the dark side he is. I think that's why he killed Han. I genuinely think that maybe he was he was at conflict, which he's made quite clear because he's praying to the Mask of Vader, isn't he? Um, feeling good thoughts. And, isn't, uh, yeah, been feeling good thoughts and all the rest of it. And I think you know he was ready to hand over his lightsaber and he was ready to to go back with Han. But then I think. He thought that by by killing Han, by doing something as as utterly monstrous as that, would help him turn even more to the dark side. So I think that kind of fight there, and I think this is this is obviously going to lead on to episode eight because I think you're going to see him being trained more. You're going to see Ray being trained, obviously by Luke. I think that's what it's leading up to. They're going to be the two protagonists that we're going to follow when it comes to the Force. I think you're going to see uh, John, John Bayega. You're going to see John Boyega become more of the Han character, you know, the the, the rogue. You've also Poe. We didn't see much of Poe, and the other the other character who I thought got short shrift was um, Captain Plasma or Phasma. Yeah, Captain Phasma. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she was, and didn't didn't she let the shield down rather quickly? <laughs> for, she was 
bit of a pussy when it came down to it. <laughs> but it done to you. No, hang on a minute. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, the, there's all that side. So I think, Kylo, there's lo- there's lots to, to go there. And we'll come to the last battle in a minute. I know you didn't like him. Why didn't you like him, Mark? I just found him really unconvincing. But I think I had problems with him from the off because... I went to my local cinema. I didn't have the opportunity to go into the IMAX yet. Uh, and the speakers at the front are just not very good. So they're, they're basically just three woofers at the front. And there was no definition in the sound when it when it was low. Like, And I just couldn't hear what he was saying, which, which really doesn't help. So half the stuff he was saying when he was wearing his mask, I, I couldn't really understand. I, I really struggled to hear him. And then when he took his mask off, he just, he just looked like, I don't know, some sort of foppish boarding school boy with a no, separation no, anxiety or something yeah, be- I fancied Kylo Ren <laughs> <laughs> yeah I just be- found him totally unconvincing but yeah. then it could have been a lot of the setup in the I, I think I think it's first viewing as well because there's lots of things you know that I didn't pick up on with first viewing I think I was the same as you Steve there was the emotional aspect of it you know please be good please be good please don't be shit you know please don't be a prequel there was a lot of that going on there was a lot of fact that you didn't know where things were going when they're really paying attention as well to absolutely everything that was going on, which I was second time around. I think I was more relaxed. I don't know about you, Steve, but I just sat back and let it flow over me the second yeah. time and, and tried to take in as much as I could about plot points and so on. So I think you need to see it again, Mark, just to, just to no, make I agree, sure. I agree, I um, agree. I did go in there quite tense. And, and yeah. yeah, and I ended up, I wanted to go in and just enjoy it. And that was what my mindset was, but I find myself analysing it a lot during the during the movie, and it probably took away my enjoyment a little bit. So I just need to go and see it in better better quality picture yeah. and sound, and just let it wash over me. I think. Yeah. So I think that the most interesting character for me, because I'd never seen him before, don't know where he's come from, and that's the Grand Leader. Is it Snook? Snook. Like it Snook. Snook. Leader. Supreme Leader. Snook. Snook. Um, name? Silly name, but but. The big theory is that this is Darth Pl- uh, Plagueis, who Palpatine talks oh. about in Episode Three to Anakin, and uh, it's Palpatine uses it to to hook him in and turn him to the dark side on the promise that he could save save Amidala. But there's lots of things that that if you read the fan theories and also the other theories that have popped up, there's lots of things that fit um, that say that he is obviously Darth. Pl- Plagueis, a big thing's going to happen in the next film. We'll find that out. That he was he was killed by Palpatine in the backstory, wasn't he, Steve? For as That's far as Palpatine I understand, says it. he did. He says, yeah. he was, well, Palpatine's saying it in a roundabout way. He's saying he was ki- murdered by his apprentice. And the implication yeah, being, of course, the, the, yeah, Palpatine's he was the apprentice. apprentice. Yeah, but the thing is that that his gift, Darth Pla- Plagueis, is that um, he could make people come back from that. He could create new life and make people come back from the dead. And when you see his which we, we generally find out because um, you think, God, he's big, and then you find out it's a hologram. But if you look at the injuries to his face and so on, then that kind of makes sense. But also, there's this thing that was it Kylo that turned against Luke. It could well have been uh, General Leader Snook or Plagueis, which would make more sense because if you think about Kylo, he wasn't a much of a match, even though he was injured and he wasn't at his best. He wasn't a much of a match for Finn and for Ray, was he? I mean, there wasn't a great deal in it in terms of force, in yeah. terms of skill. So he, he couldn't have turned on Luke, could he, really? It wouldn't make much sense unless Luke just, you know, left the whole thing and let him kill all the younglings and, and disappear. So I don't think it was Kylo. I don't know what you think, Steve. Well, I don't, I don't I think it was. I, th- I think um, it was Kylo Ren or, or Ben. Um, hang on, what would he be called? Ben Solo. Would that be his correct name? Um mm-hmm. He turned on Luke because he was being turned to the dark side by um, whoever Snook is behind the scenes. But I think in terms of the, the film itself, they give the impression he's really powerful. I mean, at one point he stops a laser blast in mid-flight, yeah, using the Force. I mean, you get, oh, this guy's really powerful. But then at the end, he's not, the, you know, he doesn't use any of these powers against um, um, Finn's character, who is just an ordinary person swinging a lightsaber around. And it, you could say at least against um, Ray she could counteract it to some degree because she was full sensitive as well. But I know he was shot and therefore slightly injured and therefore not performing to his full capacity, but it felt like having set him up to be this really powerful character, he wasn't so powerful. I mean, maybe you could say he's emotionally disturbed because he just killed his own father as well, but yeah, but it did I, kind I of feel like a misstep towards the end. That suddenly anyone can just chuck a lightsaber around and look really good. But is he Sith? 
Well, um, I don't know whether the cyst still exists or whether he wants to be. I mean, there's lots of questions. Like we said, there's lots of questions. They obviously, they are setting up not just future Star Wars episode you know, eight and nine, but also standalone films as well, I think. Um, and there's lots of questions that need answering, which I guess is fun because it makes it, we can sit here and speculate and then hopefully find out more in the in the, uh, in the the next film, which we only have to wait 17 yeah. months you for, see, which is I, quite cool. I, I know what you're saying about um, Kyla's character when you first see him and all the rest of it, but actually... Uh, is he that strong with the force? Is is he that well developed? Is he's, he's obviously not. He well, didn't finish his training because he well, does actually say I need to finish. Well, this his is what points to to the Grand Leader Snook being the Sith Lord and being Darth Plagueis. That's be, point, because because nice he says go. With the prequels, it? Yeah, he says go find him because he needs to complete his training to uh, General Hux, doesn't he? he said, at, at the end, he said, "Go find him and bring him to me." He needs to complete his training. So this is why I'm thinking that. The whole thing with Luke's Jedi Academy, it wasn't Kylo who did the damage. I think it was Snook. I think it was Darth Plagueis. And I think that's where his injuries came from, was fighting with Luke. I think Luke ultimately won the battle that they had between each other. I mean, I'm just speculating here, but this is... I'm not quite sure why Luke went into hiding that. It seems a bit strange to do. Like it does, doesn't it? Alert, and, basically. and the other thing is that his gift was supposed to be able to see the future. Because in, in Empire, he goes off to Cloud City because he sees that his friends are in trouble. Yeah? Yeah. Which he goes away and hiding on this, and he must have known that Han was in trouble. No, possibly. But then again, don't forget in the prequels, the Sith, the, the um, Jedi, uh, their ability to use the Force was diminished, wasn't it, because of the influence of the Sith, and they couldn't see what was going to happen to them, for example. Yeah. Um, there's, not, there's not a great deal of consistency in some of this stuff, to be honest. There, there isn't. But, really but at the same time, but at the same time, I want to bring it back to what you said, which was there was a lot, lot of plot holes here and there, and, and there's a lot of things that didn't quite make sense. But we're sitting speculating about them. We're sitting yeah, talking about them. We're trying to put two and two together and so on. So I think to a great extent, I think it's worked. Well, I genuinely really want to see the next one. Can't wait. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Totally. Did and anyone think that the new Storm... I don't know if it was me, but the new Stormtrooper outfits... Too shiny. Quite cool. Too plastic. I well, it wasn't so much that. But they made everyone look really short and fat. <laughs> <laughs> they did, I think. I they were using yeah. really stocky legs. Yeah. Or they were, it was something with design, but everyone looked like, like a dwarf, basically. But, well, obviously, the, the backstory there is that they have been developed by General Hux, haven't they, as a line of troopers from... No, was it Hux or was it the other guy? I can't remember now. Um, so anyway, to to take them they, they are not clones. Yeah. So they are raised from birth to be stormtroopers and brainwashed and, and conditioned a certain way to perform the roles because uh, I think the clones only had a certain life um, life expectancy, didn't they? And yeah, they it was, mentioned that. I can't remember it was. No, no, it wasn't mentioned in this film, but so it, is was part of, it is part of the... Um, what did you say? I, I think it was in the Clone Wars, wasn't it, that it was revealed that the stormtroopers, the clones only have it's a certain... In Rebels, um, in, in Rebels, yep. uh, Star Wars Rebels, they say that basically the clones are accelerated growth, so they have all died out by the time you get to A New Hope, and what they've used is basically conscripted um, so normal people, soldiers. Yeah. That's what the stone talk to which is why they're not. That, that, was, that was my understanding. Door with <laughs> yeah, but, but there, is a, there is a line in the film where he says, um, I should have used clones. Yeah, yeah, which is but the only reference really to the prequels, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think. And he says, no, 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 my experiments will work. They, you know, they're raised from trials, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, um, so that that was that. There was another, um, it's gone right out my head now. Oh yeah, when you're talking about stormtroopers, did you hear the the lift from A New Hope? The dialogue yeah, yeah, lift. Yeah, but they've, they've been the, the, split up now. The level three and four. Yeah, the split up. Yeah, <laughs> which yeah. I thought was a nice. Also, touch. they missed a really obvious gag. I don't know why they didn't do it because they seem to be setting it up. But when they're running towards that spaceship, and she goes like, "I'm a pilot. We can fly that." And he goes, "What about that one? Oh, that's garbage." Then the pep, one in the front of them blows up, and she goes, "All right, the garbage will do." And the camera pans around, and it's the Falcon. Surely she should have called it. That's junk. a piece of junk. Yeah, isn't that the obvious thing to say? That was. Oh, it I was. Yeah, that was. I don't know why they didn't do that. It may. It may have been too obvious, though. Right, oh, let's. Well, there are plenty of other things in it were blatantly yeah. obvious, yeah. like the chess set piece coming yeah. on and everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they're just nice little homages, aren't they? Back to, I, I think he, ha he had to do. He had to. I do thought that. there was too many. I'll be honest. I thought there was too many. Did you know? I, I enjoyed them. I, I liked them. I thought they were really good. I, thought, I think you were saying it, Phil. But the bit when hands on the spaceship with the two gangs turn up, basically wanting their money back. If that's an insight into what we can expect from the Han Solo, young Han Solo project. Yeah, I think it would be brilliant. I'm quite looking forward to that because yeah. that was really fun. Yeah, it was really funny. It was really well put together. The relationship with Chewie, I mean, I thought I thought Harrison Ford absolutely stole this film. And yeah. and I can see why that was the case because he knew he was getting his get out, get out clause, wasn't he? So he could have fun with the character. He, he could really do what he wanted to do with the character. And I think that really came across. 
I thought yeah, he was I thought he was absolutely brilliant. I thought he stole the film. He's far better in this than he is in Jedi. Yeah. He, oh, he absolutely stole it. Like Chewie yeah. was good as well. Chewie was brilliant. What do you mean you're cold? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, do you want to talk about Mark Hamill now? <laughs> um, yeah, well, I wanted to mention that. And quickly before we, we go on to Mark Hamill, just to round it off, um, I thought the whole new cast were absolutely brilliant. I, I, I especially like Ray. I think she's fantastic. She's good, yeah. Really, really good. Um, but yeah, I think he'll be all right if he comes back. There, there's a hint there that he's... Maybe this fact that he's now appears to be in a coma maybe he'll go ba- bad again with his conditioning maybe he's one that's, that's to look out for I think they just did that to get him out of the way so he wouldn't fly off at the end with Ray because otherwise he would have gone with her wouldn't he presumably well so yeah he, he wasn't yeah, he, he wasn't going to leave her alone was he because he's absolutely yeah. besotted with her so yeah but but there is that that prospect that because of his conditioning and all the rest it you know that that could be a plot device going forward you know he could turn bad you know, and then he's up against Ray, and there's that that whole history and all this. The other thing I wanted to to bring up before we go into Mark Hamill and finish it off is Maz. Who the hell is Maz? What role has she in the Star Wars universe? Again, and, and how and how does she have the lightsaber from Bespin that Luke loses when he loses his hand? That's a how does for she film. have it? <laughs> well, I think she I she me- <laughs> she mentions it in the film, doesn't she? Because Han says, "How the hell have you got that?" or lines to that effect, and she says, "Well, that's a story for another day." <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a question for another film. I think. Is what saying. <laughs> Again, in the art style art of the Force Awakens book, they were developing a Yoda type character, and that's obviously what became Maz. Um, uh, less directly, you know, a Force a Jedi Master, but more a Yoda style character. So again, they really were recycling characters and plots and she's ideas from the first. She's a pirate. She's a pirate. Yeah, she ran a bar, didn't she, basically? She's she very she's, old. She's, run, she's run a bar for a thousand years, which is inside a Jedi temple. So, Yeah, it's inside a Jedi temple. So there's something going on there. She obviously knows more than she's letting on. And then the whole lightsaber to, calling to Rey and, and all the rest of it, and she knew what was going on. Although she says to Han, what's the deal with the girl? And then the camera switches and it goes to the bounty hunters, doesn't it? That was another thing in the film. Everybody used walkie-talkies. <laughs> as a plot yeah. device wasn't it it was like the guy that wanted uh, the droid used a walkie talkie follow the girl and get the droid there's the two people in the bar who use the walkie talkies and say you know tell the resistance they're here tell the tell the first order yeah. they're here and there was one other instance where they used a walkie talkie end a scene is that going to throw back to star wars though they did the same kind of thing there didn't they people talking like that little thing that follows them back to the millennium falcon in star wars and then stop yeah talking that's, but, but that's talk. that's the only one i could remember it's just it just seemed to be that every major end of every major scene ended with somebody talking on a walkie talkie i don't know it's just something i picked up on but maz i think we need to know more about her character uh, there's obviously a plot device there now she's asking Han about the girl but I think she knows who she is I think it's yeah, pretty obvious yeah. that she knows who she is and where she comes from um, yeah. and do do the do the resistance is that why they send her because why is it her that gets sent to find Luke is it just because that she is so powerful with the force or is there something else I myself, she knows that it's because the, she had his, his lightsaber was calling to her his old lightsaber not because it's but, but. it's his daughter. Well, I mean, we always kind of assume she must be related because she looks so much like a cross between Natalie Portman and, and Kira Knightley, but I don't know. I mean, I guess that's what we have to find out. I thought, by the way, just on second viewing, did you find, I thought BB-8 became quite endearing when I first initially found him a little bit annoying. Or a little I, bit annoying. Yeah, I, I thought um, he's no Jar Jar Binks, was he? <laughs> no, no, not at all. Nothing like, there was nothing, actually, you know what? That was the thing. There was nothing in the film that felt overtly kiddy. No. No, that was it would appeal to children, yeah. it would appeal to people of all ages, yeah. but it wasn't being overtly childish, which is one thing, something when, when um, Phantom Menace came out, Lucas was going like, well, they're always meant to be kid films. Absolutely not. There's nothing in Star Wars, the original Star Wars, that's kiddish. It appeals to people of all ages and yeah. genders, yeah. but it, it's not overtly childish at, at all. And neither is Empire. Jedi, yes, that's when it starts going downhill. But this film, again, like Empire and Jedi, oh, sorry, Empire and Star Wars was... Um, was was uh, fun for all ages, but not overtly sharp, kiddish. It wasn't patronising. It didn't talk down to children in any way whatsoever. And I really like that fact. Yeah, there was no message there as well, which is also good. You know, that's the one thing about Ava- than, yeah. Ava- it's the one thing about <laughs> Avatar. Though. You know, it's the one thing about Avatar. It's all about the environment and all the rest. It's it's so heavy in message. Whereas with Star Wars films, there's none of that in it. You know, there's no message in there. What about C three PO? Is he now made out of plastic? Ah, oh, that was dreadful. What did they do to? 
that was a like something they bought in a in a you know a, a comic store or something or you know or for a for a party for a fancy dress party. It was a dreadful um, yeah. piece so, of. Um, so it, it design. looked it looked plastic, didn't it? It didn't yeah, it look really like metal. Plastic. Yeah, and it wasn't done for reflections or anything like that. So it like, was, something went horribly wrong there. I don't know what yeah. happened. I thought R two got pretty short shirt, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, that was another one which I think needs some explanation because why was he in? low power mode and why did he only come to life after Han was killed and did he sense the lightsaber? Is there something in the lightsaber that you know you switched off till Luke came back and because the lightsaber was I don't know. There's lots of theories on that one. None of them really make much sense to me, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, I mean getting back to to Luke, I mean I think we kinda knew as the titles were rolling that he'd vanished so we weren't gonna see him till the end. The only point that I thought he was gonna step in was when his lightsaber ended up in the snow. And Kyle was trying to force grab it, and it goes flying past him. And that was the one point where I thought it was going to end up in in Luke's hand. Luke was just going to turn up there. And, yeah, but it didn't happen. I don't know, yeah, it was weird because I actually, in the second time I saw it, I actually st- activated, my, activated a stopwatch on my watch, and Luke's on screen for sixty seconds, of which only thirty seconds are actually Mark Hamill. The rest of it is clearly a body double down top of that hill in Ireland. Um, and that, you know, you think, oh, blimey, thirty seconds. <laughs> you kind of think why don't they just end with them going off to find him and have you know and just have him in the next film because it felt like it was kind of shoehorned in right it, the yeah end. It, it would it would have been a good ending and it and it would have been a, a sort of full circle thing to lando and chewie going to find yeah, han empire, yeah. in empire you know although you you had daisy dressed as han <laughs> like lando was in that, in, that wardrobe again <laughs> yeah in, in that strangest thing in empire that he's dressed the same as han that's a bit yeah it's a bit creepy that um anyway uh, I guess they had to have Luke in there somewhere, didn't they? I guess that's why yeah, they went I think they bottled it and thought we've got to show him at the end. And yeah. Yeah. I guess but, it kind of uh, works. There, there is a lot of rumour that actually he had a far bigger role, a lot of dialogue that was perhaps cut out. Um, there is rumour that, that that was the case and also the same as um, same for Maz as well because there's a whole lines there when in the trailer she's talking about I've yeah, seen you. Let the force in, is that what she said? Let the force in and who are you yeah. and um, I've seen those eyes and plenty of people. She says that to John Biego, but it's not the same lines that's in the trailer. So yeah. maybe the, maybe those were, you know, maybe things were. were There's a couple of shots out. I recognise in the trailers that aren't in the film. The, the one of Kylo Ren stumbling through the um, through the snow and then activating his lightsaber. That shots you see him with the lightsaber already turned on. So yeah. there's clearly a shot they did that they didn't use. I know that Abrams has said there's about 20 minutes of outtakes that might be on the disc. So that'd yeah. be good. So, I mean, there's loads. We could be going on and on and on and talking about this. And I think that's a positive that we're talking about it and we're we're all talking about it quite positively. It could have been a real stinker. I think the new cast are brilliant. I really like Daisy Ridley. Um, I think she, she really nails that character. She has that, it's almost that, that look of Luke, basically, and, and the feel of, you know, an outsider, which, which was what was missing, really, from, from the prequels, wasn't it? It was... It was that connection with the characters. It was following somebody that you were interested in following. I don't think anybody's interested in a little boy. Who or, could, a, or a sulky teenager. Who, who couldn't act, or a sulky teenager. There wasn't any, yeah, a, a, it, at least it wasn't a prequel. And yeah. I think I'm going to score it a nine. Mark? I had my issues with it, but I, I overall I enjoyed it. And I do want to see the next one, and I probably will go and see it again. Uh, I came out seven and a half. On reflection, I bumped it up to an eight. Yeah, I think now I'd go eight. I've got a question for you, though, uh, Phil. Now that you've seen it twice, now that you know the weekend box office numbers, do you still think it's going to make $4 billion? No, but then I was just doing that <laughs> to wind you up. Um, I, I think it, it will challenge Avatar. And the reason for that is, even though it's almost neck and neck with Jurassic World, but but Jurassic World launched in China on launch day, this film doesn't open in China, which is a massive market. Until the it is if they're January. familiar with it, but they're not that familiar with Star Wars in China. But then well, the, everyone knows about dinosaurs. So. Yeah, well, there is that, but I still think it, uh, I think the hype will carry it over there, and I think it'll do big, big, big business. So yeah. I still think it'll be it'll challenge Avatar. I don't think there's any any doubt of that. And the fact is that that's just opening weekend that we're talking about, and I've already been to see it twice opening weekend, and there'll be a lot of people like like us that have gone and seen it more than once. I know that for a fact, reading my Facebook. Uh, timeline and friends that have gone and see it and people that are interested in Star Wars going and seeing it. Yeah. And the other thing is with such a female, strong female lead, I think you'll find that there's, there's a big female audience. Yeah, they've as been well. clever with that. Very yeah. clever with that. Yeah. 
you know, they were they were they were really pushing that. I mean, it is a fair fair criticism of the original films, particularly as you know, all of them really almost no female characters in, in any of the other films. So having Ray as a, as a major character is good. We've got Princess Leia, of course, but also Captain Phasma. You know, they made her a female again to yep. push the female edgement. It's a bit cynical, but I think it's going to pay off for them. Yeah, and you got Mars as well. Did you mention Mars? Oh, Mars, yes, yes, female as well. So. Different species, but uh, <laughs> yeah, but, but again, another female character, and one of the bounty hunters was female as well. Um, I'm seeing yeah. bounty hunters, one of the bad guys, anyway. Well, yeah, I don't know what she actually was. She was just like a spy. She was, she was, she was a bit black and white, <laughs> literally. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, hopefully you haven't seen the film and you haven't sat, just sat through that and we haven't just ruined it all for you. <laughs> uh, I think we've given plenty of warnings. If you have seen the film, um, do not, please, do not put any uh, comments under the podcast re- in relation to the Star Wars Force Awakens. Please go to the Star Wars forum. There is a thread in there which is for spoilers. It's for talking about the plot and so on. Please go and add your thoughts to that thread and not the podcast thread please keep the podcast thread spoiler free when it comes to star wars um but that's it for this year and for the podcast thank you very much uh, for listening and tuning in every week and downloading the podcast it is appreciated and uh, we'll see you again on january the 13th so i need to do is thank steve withers get back to jersey you moron who's that steve williamson steve williams <laughs> williams <laughs> that's it is that the steve williamson <laughs> And uh, Mark. I'm so annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one good thing about regret. It's never too late. You can always change tomorrow if you want to. Oh, is that your quote? Is it right? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, I think uh, we've overstayed our welcome. So thanks for listening, and we'll see you again very soon.